me let that go now. Hey everybody, uh, it's Andrew Plank with Arella Page, and we've got here with us Jen Lowe from, she's a mortgage broker with, uh, you're with Dominion? Uh, Modern Mortgage Sorry. Group for Dominion Lending. Yeah. Right on. And uh, this is He Said, She Said, They Said. Uh, normally we have Jane Johnson uh, with us as well. She's with Remax Camosun and she's off with family in Vancouver because it's that time of year uh, where where we uh, we try to take a little bit of time off if we can. So today we're going to be talking um, a little bit about mortgage rates and uh, we're also going to do a recap on the um, on the uh, stats from last month. So um, usually Jane and I talk stats together and we usually have our guest in the background, but I'm going to keep Jen in while we talk stats today and uh, we'll just go through the, the stuff. Now, this is going to be a little bit jangly today, just giving everyone a bit of warning. This is my first time hosting this. Uh, Jane is usually at the helm with the controls and she's left us with this <laughs> and uh, myself and Jen and, and Danielle, Jane's assistant, none of us <laughs> have done this before. So bear with us. Um, but uh, Danielle, could you bring up the stats, please, that, that you had for just the, um, the Victoria Real Estate Board? There's the ones. Okay. So it's been an active market out there. And, and, and uh, Jen, of course, being in, in the mortgage industry um, is, is parallel to us in terms of seeing how, how busy this is. Jane and I have been talking a lot about the stats and we, we go through this every, every month and we've lately been seeing often new listings versus pendings, the green versus the purple line being pretty close. And it's interesting to see this month, uh, the month of July, that is, sorry, yeah, the month of July uh, was, uh, to, oh no, sorry, <laughs> this is the last seven days. Bear with me. This is the last seven days. So in the last seven days of August, we had uh, 207 new listings, only 166 properties going pending. And normally that's more of an even, that's lately been more of an even number. 34 price decreases as well. So you, that sort of suggests that we're seeing a little bit more of a, um, a slowing in the market. And yet um, I can tell you that demand is still very, very high. And what I see from this uh, is that one of the problems is in the number down below at this, we're going to see active listings down here, at the very bottom of this, uh, August 2021, there's 1,311 active listings right now. And last year there was 2,584. So quite a few less active listings. So although um, there's high demand, the choice is so low that I, I think people are hesitating to purchase the properties that are available on market just because they don't want to buy just because there's less choice, but they do want to buy. Jen, do you have any comments on that? Yeah, quick question, Andrew. So how does yes. this compare? I know we don't have the 2019 stats there, but. 2020 is a hard year to compare to because as we were just saying earlier yeah. uh, it, we had this, our spring market was in the summer basically so in compared to 2019 how does yes. where we're at right now yeah let me try so, uh let me try sharing oh yeah th thanks danielle there we go uh actually one back ja danielle if you could the top the top one here and it's, I can, I, it's very small, but this, this top graph that, that has the three little bounces in it, the total active MLS listings, there were 3,000 in July 2019. And then, you know, we typically have a seasonal adjustment and it goes down towards December, but you can see then 2019, we bounced up, but nowhere near as high. And then you can just see how low we are now at the, like just bouncing around the 1200 number. Does that, so we've gone, from 3,000 listings in 2019 to just about 1,200. Wow. Yeah. Jeez. Yeah. So it's just like anything, you know, if you're going shopping and uh, you need to buy some, I don't know, you need, you need to stay, not a staple, you wanna buy a, a new canoe, um, but the shelves are, are, are empty and there's just a few left and you don't like the choices, you might wait on your choice of buying a canoe, even though you really want a new canoe. This is maybe not the best yeah. analogy, but I just bought a canoe recently, so I'm using that. But yeah. I think that's no, why I mean, we're seeing high demand, but low 
sales. We need more supply. Definitely. So, um, yeah. We also have um, 1,439 real estate agents active in the Victoria Real Estate Board. And we have, you know, so few listings. We have very little. We have less than a listing per, per agent to sell. So there's a lot of agents, I think, that in the next little while are going to be going hungry. Um, and that's going to be interesting times if that's the case. Yeah. What do we get? How do we increase the listings? Well, you know, it's seasonal for one. With summertime, people tend to go a little bit less likely to be listing their homes. They don't want to have people tromping through their homes while they're, um, you know, distracted by, you know, they don't have to be cleaning every day when they're also, it's hot. Maybe they're wanting to go to the lake and just, they'd rather have it listed at a time, usually springtime, uh, often fall. And I do know of um, a lot of, there's there's going to be an uptick at, of activity in the fall. I expect that. Uh, on the different chat groups, my colleagues are often posting about upcoming listings. There are listings coming, but how do we increase them? You know, um, I guess agents have been maybe um, a little bit less active in trying to drum up business just because we've been very reactive in the last year yeah. and just yes. reacting to business as it comes. And yeah. we, um, we always have to retool as time goes on and when new um, as, as the markets change and what's going to have to happen is people are going to have to go. This is kind of probably not a fun thing to hear, but if people, if agents want to drum up business, they're going to have to go, you know, the equivalent of door knocking and trying to drum up that business and say, you know, Hey, it's still, it's a, actually a good time to sell. People may not be aware of, of just what a, how good a time it is to be selling their property. Um, mm -hmm. I think also, what do you think? I mean, COVID people, uh, things are actually opening up now. And I think people may, uh, there were a lot of folks who were um, waiting to sell uh, until things had opened up, but also there were people who, who were not required to wait, have already listed. Um, right. So I think we'll see a big jump in the fall. Definitely a lot of life event changes where people are able to work remotely or they can work remotely and like I client that lives in Newfoundland and she can work remotely. So she'd far rather live in BC. So right. moving, you know, moving to BC while able to continue her employment. Mm -hmm. And maybe the working remotely is also a reason why we're not seeing properties coming on market. Cause if you're working from home right now, uh, you may not want to be having people coming through your home, especially if you're doing video calls and having to be, um, you know, you don't want to be disturbed yeah. in that, but yeah. Life changes are always happening. You know, life goes on. People are, you know, divorcing, getting married, having children. There's always some change happening. But um, um, what I'm really seeing is a bit of a migration. Uh, as you mentioned, people are choosing to want to come here. And then there are people who are choosing to have to move away. And a lot of the, I think a lot of the younger generation are finding that they're just can't afford to buy in Victoria. Yeah. Uh, which is too bad. Yeah. Um, no, the... The price point. Well, one of the stats I pulled up, um, mm. the average age for first time home buyers, now this is across Canada, is 36 years old. Really? Yeah. Okay. My across first Canada, home. average age. And what do you have any idea what that was last year or in, in previous years? That this was pulled off of Stats Canada from 2020. So 2020, 36 average, yeah. years is the average. Yeah. Okay. First time home buyers. And first time home buyers, not the average. Yeah. Yes. Oh my. First time home okay. buyers. Yeah. 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 Like I said, I was I was 21 when I bought my first home here in Yeah. And when I work with first time buyers, they're usually in their late 20s, early 30s, is what historically it has been for me. Mm -hmm. I mean, every once in a while, you meet somebody who has never bought a home and they're 50 years old. Um, True. And that's, that, Which that is does great. happen and that will bring, yeah. that doesn't happen often. No, no. But people, are, I think, yeah, that average age is increasing, especially mm -hmm. in our area. Right. You have to save for longer or you need to get farther in your career in order to make it affordable. Mm -hmm. I think people too, and, and Jane and I have talked about this in the past, but I think the whole concept of the property ladder, um, there are people who just don't want to compromise. They don't want to. They don't want to buy a home that they actually 
will compromise living in. So they don't want to buy less than they want now. So they want it. They're starting out wanting their end result. Right. They're starting out wanting their dream home. Well, and it's an interesting concept. I know I did it multiple times. Um, when we bought, I bought my first home, it was like, this is our forever home. We won't be moving. We can live here forever. And then yeah. you have the kids and all of a sudden your three bedroom rancher, 1200 square feet is not working. Yeah. <laughs> so then you need, you want to get a bigger house or you need their bedrooms yeah. farther away from your bedroom. So, and I did that probably four or five times that, no, this is our forever home. We're not moving again. <laughs> right. And then you move again. <laughs> I, I generally advise people to, you know, not think in terms of that forever home at the yes. same time not to be buying a home unless they have at least a five-year um, use case, I guess, a five-year span of what they mm -hmm. want to be doing. Because it, otherwise, generally speaking, three to five years is the time frame where it makes sense to buy, where if you have to resell, you're going to be doing better than if you just rented and put, socked the extra money aside. Yeah. And so, but most people do. I mean, I talk to a lot of people and they talk about their forever home. And, uh, and then, you know, things change in life. Yes. But, um, but no, just, you know, even if you can't afford the house that you um, really, really want, if, you know, there's only certain times in your, our lives where we seem to be in that position where we can actually afford a home or a second home or whatever we're thinking or an inv investment property, wherever we're at or whatever our goal is, we get to that point where we can do this and there's a window where it's possible. And then, um, and then either the market changes or our circumstances change and we decide it's not for us. But what I've found is, and I'm, you've seen this, I'm sure so many times, Jen, is those people who have bought, um, I hear so many people say, I wish I'd bought five years ago. I wish I'd bought 10 years ago. <laughs> and, you know, the market's gotten away from me and houses are so expensive now. And yeah. I remind people that houses were so expensive then too. Money's worth a different amount now. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Well, and then another stat here that I pulled up is over 83% of people break their mortgage early. 83% break it early. Yeah. Wow. And hundreds, in my, in my, you know, with um, my client portfolio, that is bang on. Like it, hmm. most people break their mortgage early. And what, so for, uh, for moving or for, what are the, what are the reasons? Change, moving from their forever home to a new forever home, right? right? Um, yeah, doing renovations, paying off uh, debts, um, you know, buying that car payment or getting that car, having that car payment and then finding it not affordable. Um, house value increase so that, that they want to utilize some of the equity to purchase an investment property. Um, right. All things so when you say they break their mortgage you're saying that they actually they don't they don't exactly break it but they they change the parameters and they they extend it or they they buy another home and 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 blend it into the new home or yeah that kind of yeah prior to the end of their five-year term right they want to break right. it early due to mm -hmm. whatever the situation maybe the um, to get out of it basically Maybe you could talk a little bit about the terms because that's one of the things that, you know, I think people don't, you know, five years is sort of the standard, but there's lots of other options, right? And I guess five yes. years is kind of what everyone chooses to, most people choose to do, probably 83% of them. Yeah. But. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's unfortunately the, um, the one to five year, you, well, you can go with a one to five year fixed rate technically you can go up to a 10 year term um, but you're paying a premium to get that fixed rate for longer right right you're gambling that the rates will um, you're gambling that the rates will uh, uh, increase go up I guess and you're yeah. you're insulated yes um, but you know and the, the banks want you to lock into a five year term usually that five-year fixed term is kind of the go-to rate that everybody just wants a five-year fixed. Right. Um, the um, other option is looking at a variable rate and the variable rate is also a five-year term, 
um, where your what's guaranteed for five years is um, the spread that you're going to receive off of prime rate. So your your rate will vary, um, and honestly, it can't really go any further down because it's we're at mm. rock bottom rates. But um, the, where the variable rate is versus the fixed rate, um, you do really pay a premium to have that five year fixed rate. Okay. Right. If you feel, okay. Yeah, that's right. You can lock in too, if you're on variable at some point, but then if you're two years in on a five-year term, then you're locking in on the three-year because that's what's left. Right. Is that right? Right. That's yeah. correct. Yeah. yeah. And normally it doesn't make sense to lock in. No. Um, statistics show, I don't have the exact stat, but yeah, statistics show that it just doesn't, you want to ride out any fluctuations in the rate. Um, quite often the media tie together fixed and variable rates when they're advertising or letting the public know that rates are changing, rates are going up, rates are going up. But they're two, they're based on two separate um, uh, entities for what changes the interest rates. Right. Yeah. Do you find, I mean, I find that um, I get clients who try to game the system and, and time it so that they absolutely get the very best, you know, they're buying at the bottom of the market and they want to see the rise and so on. And yet on average, I'd say that people who buy just buying, as I was saying earlier, tend to do okay over time. And, mm -hmm. you know, by waiting to try to game the system, they often lose. Do you find that as well? Yes. 100%. It's just like investing too, right? You know, you try and time to buy that stock or when everyone else is buying it, that's not when you want to buy it. You want to buy it when everyone's selling it. <laughs> that's right. Yeah. Because they're scared, right? You know? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I find like right now is a low inventory, high demand time. It's not a bad time to buy, but you probably won't see the same kind of price appreciations in, in that we that we've seen so far coming here out and you also you know what it, I often find that people like I remember a time uh, earlier on in my career where there was just so much selection and choice and prices were not really going up much and nobody was buying and yet there were some amazing homes that were coming up and I was like oh this is such a good deal for somebody but nobody wanted to buy because they thought oh you know the next one's there's just a there's an abundance of choice and nobody's willing to make a choice yeah yeah that good it's, old supply versus demand i guess people are funny that way you know yeah. um because if they bought a great home at that time they would still have a great home today but now people are buying you know homes uh from a shotgun approach based on you know 10 people making offers and right. uh it's a little bit harder to to find a good selection um and again in 10 years time at least they will have that equity that if they hadn't bought they would be able to move it on uh, to something else and, and jump up that ladder. But um, yeah. Did you have any other fun stats for us, Jen? I know you, uh, um, we were, yeah. Do you have any other fun stats for us? Those are the, did I, and I said, so over 83% of people break their mortgage early. And then yes. um, the average time for breaking your mortgage is 36 months. So okay, just around uh, three years which is very, I find that very regularly too. So the key thing in, you know, lots of people really like to go with the five-year fixed rate, um, you know, because you want to get your best five-year guaranteed fixed rate. But right. what lots of people don't factor in is that, well, the chances of them breaking their mortgage is very high. Um, right. And if they don't think they will, the, chance, the statistics show that, the chances of them breaking their mortgage is there. And um, sorry, and there's a little bit of noise in the background. Sorry about that. Can't hear it. Uh, can, can you hear it? Is it? No. no? Oh, good. Okay. Um, yes. So the chances of them breaking their mortgage is really high. So why not go with a variable rate um, where you're going to get a lower rate and a lower penalty? Because what's hidden with the five year fixed rates is the penalties. Um, are much higher to get out of them early. If you were to go, I mean, you can't really predict. I mean, if you're going to break your mortgage, um, 
you can't say that three it's three years is the average so it's not you're not going to know that on three years but i'm just curious that if you'd went with a, a five year at the higher at the lower interest rate versus a three year at a bit of a higher interest rate but then you didn't actually have to break it because you're three years in um, mm -hmm. i'm just wondering how those two costs would compare it may not be it's hard to say because of um, the three year would have the greater of a three month interest penalty or an interest rate differential penalty yeah. um, versus your at worst, your penalty for getting out a variable rate mortgage is a three month interest penalty. Yes. So yeah, the interest rate differential is one that uh, most people don't understand. And I always like it every time it comes up and I'm, I'm, I please explain this to people. Yes. Well, and when you go on the bank's website, for example, RBC mm -hmm. website, the last I checked, now this was a few months ago, the example they're using are like 9% like interest rates. So they're so old that it doesn't give a true picture of what the penalty could be. Right. So, so yeah. in the past, I've seen penalties of fifteen or twenty thousand dollar penalties for breaking a, a, a fixed rate mortgage. Yeah. Um, easily. Yeah. Easily. Okay. Yeah. So, so for folks listening, sorry. Well, for folks the, listening, the Jen, do you want to tell people what the actual interest rate differential penalty means, how it applies, and how it works? So how it works is is they take. Um, what your five-year fixed rate is. So let's just say, for example, you got a 2% five-year fixed rate. However, the posted five-year fixed rate is 5.25. So what they don't really tell you is you've got a discount of 3.25 off of the posted rate. So when they're determining what your penalty is, there's also factoring in this discount, which basically, I mean, just for, you know, uh, total uh, estimate, you could yeah. triple what your penalty would be on the uh, variable rate side, at least. Oh, interesting. Okay. So that's a good way to, to look at it is um, you can't say this set in stone, but if you have a fixed yeah. rate and you break it, your penalty could be three times, easily three times what the penalty would be if you'd gone variable rate. Looking at the current rates now. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it's always the greater of the yeah. three month interest penalty or the interest rate differential penalty. Yeah. The operative word there being the greater of. So yeah. whatever's going to get the yes. bank more money. The bank yeah. has the bank has assumed a certain amount of profit on you paying your mortgage every month. And on a on a variable rate, that profit is more in alignment with the current reality of what the rates are. So if you break that, you're they're they're not they're not losing a bunch of future income because they can lend at the same rate. But if they've yeah. locked you in at a certain rate, that's maybe higher than current rates. And then you, you want to break that. They're going to project the remaining time of your mortgage. Right. And say, exactly. well, we're losing this much money. Yeah. So You're going to pay take a bigger penalty. Yeah. 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 Exactly. So. so, and it's business, you know, it's not them being greedy. It's them. You've made an agreement to, pay this mortgage over this much time. And by breaking that, um, they are now lo no longer making what they'd anticipated making. And they have to go and lend that money, which is not uh, worth as much to lend now to someone else. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, yeah, good times. Um, you've got a wrap yeah. report coming up. Yes, I do. Yeah. I'm very excited. Yeah, it should be lots of fun. I'm gonna be uh, I'm gonna be off to Tofino for a bit, and uh, we were just talking before the show about how um, how uh, this time of year, you know, agents and everyone else is a little bit tired from the spring market, and uh, um, how last year there was really no spring market, so we had a really busy summer market. And we didn't really get to have time off. Uh, now with the openings, COVID openings, and everything, I kind of uh, anticipate that. Um, all of uh, everyone out there who's working with their realtors. I mean, I'm, we're, I'm still working, but I'm also finding I'm my, I'm my weekends. I'm being a little bit more drawn to, I mean, we all have relationships and family and so on, and we, we can't spend all our time working. So um, this is the time of year where we typically kind of try to disengage at least a little bit. Yes. 
Yes. Yeah. Last right. summer there was not, there was, yeah, definitely working all summer. I mean, we couldn't go away anyways. Whereas this summer it, um, I'm covering actually for a coworker this week and she's going to cover for me when I'm gone. So it, it will be nice to have a, a much needed break to relax. And Excellent. Yeah. And it's so good to have coworkers that you trust that you can just leave your business with and uh, be able to do that kind of stuff. And, and your clients are still in good hands. Yes, very much so. So I think we kind of skipped over some of the stats. So I kind of want to circle back to those and then maybe we can, we can wrap this up. Um, uh, so Danielle, could you bring those stats back up? Sure. Um, actually the first, we'll, we'll go to the first one. Uh, one more back. There we are. So we talked about new listings uh, in the last week, 207 versus 106, six, six, 166 that went pending. 34 price decreases. Again, that's uh, that means properties are actually not selling, haven't sold, and uh, people are actually readjusting their price, which is good, good to see. Um, and uh, 258 sold. That's just the number that closed. 13 expired. So again, these are ones that they went through the whole listing contract and didn't actually get uh, somebody coming to the table to buy. So not even in this really low inventory marketplace, not everything is selling. You can't just put whatever price you want on a property. Um, Comparing August 2021 to August 2020, this is the stats at the bottom space here. In the last week, we had 164 unconditional sales uh, versus the last, for the full month of August, we had 979 unconditional sales. For the full month of August in 2020, 1,333 new listings. So way more listings uh, than sales. Uh, and then we had so far this month, 243 new listings. Um, active listings, though, that's the one we've been just so talking about, 1,311 active listings. It's just, this is incredibly low inventory. Um, but do expect to see some uh, some bump in this in the fall. And uh, there's always good properties, and we agents uh, are always connected with, with stuff. And if you're needing some um, advice on money, definitely want to talk to Jen Lowe. Um, because she can she can definitely help you to determine what your affordability is and set up for something to buy. Even though right now it's low inventory, don't get distracted. Um, there's a saying, I wanna, I, I'm going to quote it, I won't bring it up. Uh, it sounds like it's a quote from Martin Luther King. If you So this is just about getting into the market at any time. Um, if you can't fly, then run. If you can't run, then walk. If you can't walk, then crawl. But whatever you do, you have to keep moving forward. And yeah. I like that. Yeah, me too. And I feel, feel like a lot of folks are trying to fly when they're not actually capable of flying. And yet it's time, uh, and not every time is a good time to buy a home. And your everybody's circumstance is different. But I do find a lot of folks um, hesitate when they really do need to take action. And as long as we're continuously moving forward and Jen, you know, you're an active person, active agent, uh, active mortgage broker, you're always moving forward. You're always building yes. your business. And that's 100%. what brings you success, right? Yeah. 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 hundred percent. Yeah. And that's why you deserve to go rafting and have some time off as well. Cause we all, <laughs> we all need that anyway, folks. Um, yeah. Jen, do you have anything you want to say to wrap up or anything you'd like to leave everybody with? Uh, well, feel free to reach out anytime if you have any mortgage questions, even if you just want to inquire about getting uh, pre-approved. It's never too early to inquire. Um, happy to help. I agree 300%. It's never too early to reach out and talk to your mortgage broker. There's so much that they can do to help guide you and consult with you to help get you um, to an understanding of what's what's required. And if uh, if anybody would like to reach out to me, I'm Andrew Plank with Royal LePage, and uh, you can reach me on my, you can text me or call me at 250-360-6106, uh, email info at andrewplank.com. My website, andrewplank.com, uh, has lots of great resources as well. So, Jen, thanks so much for joining us today. We missed uh, Jane. I don't know if she's watching this right now, but we missed you, Jane. Yeah. Um, 
So we'll see you again next week, everyone. And Jen, you will be back. We really appreciate you. And uh, yeah. in the background, we had Danielle helping out with uh, with uh, with some support here. So that's awesome. Thanks so much, Danielle. Thanks, everybody. Have a good week. We'll see you next week. Bye. Bye.